staying on schedule here. Thanks for everyone for being here today. Uh, I guess we were competing with the beach and the surf uh, on a day like today, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll do some surfing here, uh, internet style. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, technology innovations coming out of China and the parallels with uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Uh, the genesis for this event was uh, hanging out in San Francisco for, I don't know, for about a month and going around to all the accelerators and interviewing a number of startups and a number of VCs. Uh, and what was interesting to me is not only seeing the shift from Silicon Valley to San Francisco moving north, uh, but also seeing a, a real uh, surge of activity here in San Francisco from venture capitalists who I know from China. Uh, so many of them have moved back uh, to the Bay Area and they're on the program today uh, as well as some of the portfolio companies that they're investing in. Uh, so it's really great to be able to bring uh, a little bit of uh, Beijing and Shanghai and Hong Kong uh, here to San Francisco, and we'll be talking about that intersection and East meets West uh, here today. Uh, we have a great program coming up. Um, we uh, do regular events uh, in Silicon Valley, in New York, in, in China, uh, Sydney, and London. Uh, we do about 10 events per year. Uh, so if you're not in our network yet, please, please join up so you can get invites to more events. Our next one is going to be in Hong Kong, by the way, on April 15th at Cyberport. Uh, so uh, I think I have the program up on the uh, URL already, Silicon Dragon Ventures, so you can check out the program there. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, say a little bit about uh, our terrific speakers we have here today and the format for today. We're going to be going through a couple of tech chats, what we call tech chats. These are one-on-one -on -one Q and A interviews uh, led by journalistic moderators who know how to ask good questions uh, and get good answers. We have uh, four of these tech chats coming up, and then uh, we have a spotlight with Victoria Wu, who is heading up WeChat's efforts here in the U.S. And then finally, we're closing with a venture capital and deal maker panel. So this is going to go for about two hours. So uh, then we get to have some fun and go out on the patio and have drinks and appetizers. But uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here. And I hope you'll enjoy the show. I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage uh, our first tech chat panelist. Uh, this would be Sonny Vu, who is the founder of Misfit Wearables. Uh, he's going to be interviewed by journalist and entrepreneur uh, Janet Kornblum. And I'd like to welcome them to the stage. Uh, each one of these tech chats is about 15 minutes, uh, covering the milestones, opportunities, challenges that the entrepreneurs face as, as, as they've ramped up their startup. Uh, so uh, Janet and Sonny, please come up. Um, how you started and just the basics on your funding and that, the basics so we can cover the interesting stuff. Sure, absolutely. Um, does that make sense? Oh, well, I think it's a lot more sensitive than a microphone. All right, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I feel like that's great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and honored to be invited as always. Um, we were just talking about uh, the whole startup scene on the phone yesterday, and uh, it just seems like now is uh, we're seeing some of the most incredible times uh, we've seen in quite some time. People say the markets are frothy. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's just uh, investors uh, complaining about the markets, but maybe that just means now's a great time for innovation and a great time for um, for, for, for people to be doing startups. 
Uh, we started Misfit, uh, the name of the company is Misfit. We uh, do wearable and ambient technologies, uh, technology products. We, uh, the first product we have is uh, called the Shine, uh, an activity tracker. Uh, I'm wearing one right now. Actually, I'm wearing two, one on my jacket, one here, just to mainly to show it off. Uh, we started two years ago, and um, the, uh, we, uh, I guess of note was one of the co-founders is uh, John Scully, former CEO of Pepsi and of Apple. And uh, we're an unlikely combination, but uh, it's been a lot of fun having him on board. We raised a Series A round of financing, 7.6 million in uh, April 2012. Uh, and it was actually based on a product that we have not released yet, uh, which is kind of odd because um, we, uh, shortly after we raised the fund, uh, the, the round actually, we had decided uh, not to pivot, but to branch. And so we made, uh, we decided to design Shine, our first product, which we actually went on to do a crowdfunding um, uh, campaign on. We went to uh, Indiegogo. Has anyone heard of crowdfunding here? Yes. Stuff for Indiegogo? Yeah, okay. I'm in San Francisco, what do you expect? Um, and so we, uh, so we did uh, an Indiegogo campaign that went really well. Um, actually, way better than we thought, actually, because we just didn't think, we didn't know if people would buy this product. It was kind of a, a very different type of product, uh, the Shine. And uh, it became actually one of the fastest growing campaigns. We actually hit our goal of $100,000 within nine and a half hours. And so we launched the campaign at six in the morning, and by 3.30, we had hit our goals. Uh, no marketing, no PR, I mean, no PR firm or anything like that, uh, just organic viral growth. And so we said, okay, this is something we should do. And so uh, one thing led to another, and we uh, went to the Apple Store and a bunch of other places. And then before we knew it, uh, we, uh, we shipped 200,000 units last year. And then we raised a most recent round of financing, uh, which took us to Asia, and uh, actually Hong Kong as well. Uh, and so we raised a Series B round of financing uh, for $15.2 million from uh, Horizons Ventures, uh, which is based in Hong Kong. So you should explain a little bit about what Shine does, and you know, why wearables, why, why in that market? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Shine is an elegant activity monitor that you can wear anywhere. So um, it's one. Of, it's you can actually put it onto a sport band. It's a tiny little metal disc, and when you tap it, it uh, it lights up. You might be, you might even be able to see it from there. It's lighting up. <laughs> it actually works great. Right. Uh, and we um, so that's th that's the first product. And the reason why we even we thought of doing it in the first place was we saw how this space was heating up even in 2012. Just seeing how, you know, pedometers used to cost ten dollars. They're supposed to cost ten dollars, and you slap Bluetooth onto it and and a and an app, and what do you know? You can charge a hundred dollars for it, and people love it even more. And so that's what we did. And what we thought was, well, there seems to be a lot of players in this space, but they're all plastic. So let's make something that was really different and something that was really a delight to wear. And so our, uh, the bar that we were trying to hit with Shine was actually to make a product that you, would, that you would wear, that you might even wear, even if it wasn't working, okay? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, we were laughing about that too, because we, you know, we clearly haven't gotten there yet, but I think we're getting closer. Um, but I think that's, that, that's always been our view about wearables, is to be really wearable, um, I think you either have to be beautiful or invisible. That's something we've said a lot and we believe it still. Um, and I just don't think people like to wear plastic, you know? Maybe, maybe guys, us guys in Silicon Valley are okay with it, but the rest of the world, I, I, I don't know. Especially females. I mean, far be it from my wife to wear anything plastic, you know? Well, when you first entered this market, I mean, like we're talking 10 years ago, wearables was this kind of if you had a wearable computer, you were called a cyborg. Yeah. So, like, when did you imagine that this market would happen, and where do you think it's going? This idea of quantifying ourselves with things we wear in our bodies. So, um, yeah, just a few years ago, just the notion of wearable technology really summoned different types of images. Steve Mann and the cyborg, you know, um, Captain Kirk and the Borg, right? And uh, it was not really, it was interesting to read about, but not appealing, I would say, to, I would say, most consumers. And it's really only been in the last few years where we've seen a surge of interest in the consumer mainstream 
uh, space for wearable technology. And I think it's mostly because of mobile internet. You know, and I mean, it's not like we haven't had wearable products in the past. You know, we've had wearable. I mean, we've had watches for hundreds of years. So we've had wearable technology, um, but it's only because of the connectivity and ability to store, share, and analyze data that makes it interesting. But storing, sharing, analyzing data in itself isn't necessarily sufficient. It's like one of these sufficient but not necess necessary, necessary but not sufficient conditions for the proliferation of these products. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, if you have a really accurate sensor that you don't wear, the accuracy on that product is zero. Um, and so I think that's, I think we're at the very early stages of wearables. Well, why do you think people are drawn to wearables? I mean, it's something I've been thinking about. I actually got one, and I thought, why am I wearing something that's tracking me everywhere right. I go? Of course, I carry a phone that does the same thing. But what do you think it is, and where do you think the market is going from here? Yeah, it's, um, honestly, I, I, I kind of wish I knew myself. You know, we've been somewhat reactionary and opportunistic about this market by, you know, we used to see it taking off. I mean, beginnings of, of taking it off in, two, two, of it taking off in 2011, 2012. So we entered the space kind of opportunistically. But I think uh, part of it is that I think there is a hope that wearables will someday really have, bring compelling use cases. So, and so fitness and activity monitoring is one of these like no-brainer, you know, it's on the body, so let's measure things on the body. It makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, it's not necessarily one of the most, like the most, I wouldn't say it's like the most appealing low-hanging fruit, okay? Uh, but it's interesting, you know, there, it could inspire you to be healthier, maybe you shed some pounds. Uh, there's a tribal membership type of psychological effect, like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a wearable, you know, wearable product user, or I'm part of the Shine tribe, or whatever. So there is like, there, there are some of those effects, uh, but I think people and consumers are, are 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 yearning for more, you know. So, so what is the most appealing looking group? Up here. You were, you were saying that it's not the most appealing. Yeah, I, it's a good question, and I, I think if I knew, we'd probably be working on. It. And I think we are working on some of some possibilities. Um, yeah, but you know, just as we were talking on the phone uh, the other day, you know, if we if we just consider the following analogy, okay. Just think back to 1985, those of you who were around 1985, I certainly was. Um, the, you know, there, there was something you couldn't do then that we could do now that we take absolutely for granted. And that is talking on the phone. Like I could take out my phone and just call my wife right now. And back then it was just inconceivable to do something like that. But now it's, it's like, of course, in cell phones. I mean, who uses pay phones anymore, right? Um, and then if you go advance another 10 years, 1995 or so, uh, we could, there's something that you couldn't do then that, was, that is inconceivable to not be able to do now. And that is to send a message on your phone. So sending email on the go, unbelievable, you know? And I actually, so there's like a number of these use cases that are just so, that we take so for granted. And it's actually become a part of, like social habits form around that, like the, the response time required for email now. Like, I get in trouble by not responding to an email within a day. Like, I, I emailed yesterday, why didn't you respond to me? Like, well, right, but uh, 10 years ago that would never happen, or 20 years ago that would never happen. Um, but now, I, so I actually think there are probably, a, you know, several of these incredible use cases for wearables. Activity tracking not being one of them, uh, probably not being one of them, uh, that, we will be t that we will completely take for granted, say, if we were in 2020. You know, if we were in 2020, we look back and say, remember that panel we were talking, we were on in 2014 at, you know, at Silicon Dragon? And back then we were trying to figure out what that killer use case was. Right, everyone in the room wants to know. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I mean, I have some ideas, some theories, so a few things that I've been pretty excited about. Wearable identity, I think is incredibly interesting. Uh, the ability to identify yourself with a wearable product securely and persist on a persistent basis. That's really cool, there's some companies doing that. Um, being able to like predict uh, in the health and medical system, being able to predict being able to predict uh, a heart attack six hours ahead of time that would be amazing if that could if that something like that came to fruition. So uh, wearable controls, uh, there are devices now um, like the Thalmix Lab Neo device where you know it's an armband and you can just through gestures you can control your environment and whatnot. I mean that seems like 
superpowers almost. Well, do you think that there will come a time when it's completely? Do you think that there? Thanks. <laughs> Uh, this this one, but do you think that there will come a time when we get dressed in the morning, we put on our activity tracker, we put on our heart monitor, we put on our whatever other monitor that um, tracks us or that we wear, or so we can text on the fly or what? You know, I hope not. I hope not. That sounds like a really bleak future for wearables. Like if that's what you have to do, you have to remember to do stuff. Then. I think that defeats the point of a wearable product. You know, we designed Shine to not have to uh, charge, so that it could just work all the all the time. You could just have it on your body all the time. And so, um, I, I hope future products in the wearable space or in the Internet of Things space, whether you wear it or not, um, will be things that will serve us rather than the other way around. So, what about this? Is so what about clothing and, you know, that, going back five, ten years, everyone was talking about how you put your shirt on and it would, you know, be wired, and I know people, there were forays into that. I even saw an electric hairnet, which only looked good on a five foot eleven model. But <laughs> I mean, do you think that that, that sort of wear, really wearable stuff is coming to fruition? So wearable electronic textiles and soft goods, uh, very cool. Lots. I mean, there's actually a lot of startups doing that. A lot of startups in that space. Um, uh, sensor uh, textile embedded sensors, that kind of thing. Um, I actually think we're quite far away uh, from that future. I actually think that is probably, in terms of mainstream adoption, probably not for at least another five, three to five years. And the reason is um, cost and uh, cost and probably to some extent usability, but it's mostly cost. So doability is there. Like we've had sensor embedded textiles since the early 2000s. Um, so that's actually, it's actually not that hard to make products like that. Um, but it is very hard to make products like that inexpensively, you know, because, and to not require charging. So a lot of these sensor embedded shirts, $200. I've seen many that are like $800 to 1000 I mean, when was the last time you, bought, you spent more than $30 for a t-shirt, you know? And when was the last time you charged your t-shirt, you know? So. so I can't help but ask, uh, why did you call it Misfit Wearables? Oh, uh, sorry, Janet. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, we, yeah, we, uh, Misfit, so we are actually founded on um, October 5th, 2011, and if you, any of you know your Apple trivia, it was actually, it happened to be the day that Steve Jobs died. Unfortunate, was not planned, obviously. Um, and it was co-founded by me and John Scully and Sridhar. And so, um, uh, we wanted to name, we thought it, we wanted to name the company in, in, in honor of the spirit of unconventionality and doing things different, because that's kind of what you have to do as a startup to, to, to survive, I guess, and to, to thrive. I mean, that's part of the point. And um, I don't know, we thought it would be kind of a double irony because, you know, it's fitness technology, but it's misfit, you know, get it. And then um, uh, wearable technology, so again. Well, let me just stick with this particular company. At what point do, we, do you think it's going to be mainstream where you can go to Target and pick something up like this for 5 or $10 or 20 Well, in terms of the textile soft goods stuff, I think it might take some time and it might be, um, so I think that might be later than what we might think. But in terms of lower cost wearables, I think that's a sooner future, a closer future than we think. You know, um, I mean, certainly in the world of activity monitors, uh, I think what we're, we're seeing is an explosion of devices, a lot of, you know, there were 20 new activity trackers that were announced at CES this past December, uh, January. And, um, and I think over the course of 2014, part of 2015, we'll see even more devices. And then soon after that, maybe even as soon as 2015, uh, early, early, early next year, we'll see a conflation of these devices because um, people will probably start using activity monitoring watch apps. You know, like if you have a smart watch, not everybody will wear one. I don't think you're gonna need a separate activity monitor um, unless it can do more things for you. And uh, um, you know, obviously there are apps on your phone that can do some of these activities, some of these things. Thank you. Did you bring any of these uh, Shine devices with you? Uh, I, I did. I, I actually have one that I'd love to give out to, uh, I don't know if you can 
don't know if we're, how, how we need to speed one up. Uh, how about the fun? I'll take it. <laughs> the best question. The best audience question. The best audience question. There we go. Or the funniest wearable tweet. I actually have okay, or the funniest wearable tweet. Uh, how about best question and funniest wearable tweet? Okay. 